Hello and welcome to the Wisp Sports Desk with me, Chris Stafford, alongside my co-host Nancy Gillen in London. Nancy, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Excellent. So far, so good. Uh, we are already on season three, you know, episode 41, Nancy. And this is only season three. I think we did about the same, you know, with a weekly show. You know, we probably did more in the first two seasons. So I'll have to look, but we're clocking up the episodes. Yeah, I mean, we must be over, surely over 100 by now. It's a bit of a shame we didn't know, otherwise we yeah, could have had a a celebratory uh, episode. But yeah, getting getting a lot of episodes out. Yeah, maybe we should do that for the holidays. Yeah, that sounds yeah, that sounds like a an anniversary show. <laughs> yeah, an anniversary show at the end of the year. We'll do a wrap up. We we'll do a, re- a review of the news of the year because what a year it has been. So I think that's what we'll do and celebrate whatever episode that is. We'll count the previous two seasons, season one and and season two, and then add on however many episodes we've got in season three here and call that a celebration and a roundup of twenty twenty one. Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. And it's been a massive year for women's sport as well. So I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. I think we will. And it has been, we keep saying, you know, we've got so much news, so much news. And when you think of when we started doing this, and then we went through COVID and we were wondering where we were going to get the news from when nothing was happening, but we still did. But the build up, you know, when you think of the last, well, when you think of your career, how long have you been a sports journalist now? Five, six, seven years? How long? Well, no, not not that long. Uh, oh, sorry. I only started in uh, 2018. It was September 2018 when I started at Inside the Game. So that's just over three years now. Uh, so, yeah, not too long. I mean, I, kinda, I think I started doing this pretty, but like only kind of maybe six months or so after joining Inside the Game. So, yeah. Yeah, when you think of just in 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 your career, then how much women's sports has grown in terms of its coverage? Yeah, I mean, massively. I think even you know the fact that I've now moved jobs to Give Me Sport Women, which is like a dedicated outlet to women's sport. Like you, you get so many more outlets like that that are just kind of solely focused on women's sport. Um, you know, there's been new TV deals, uh, new records broken all the time. Um, I think kind of new kind of iconic sports women coming through, like people like Emma Raducanu winning over here anyway, um, her winning the US Open. And and then I suppose as well, you know, you've got the things like the Olympics and the 2019 Women's World Cup and all those big events that just promote women's sport and, and make female athletes so much more well-known. So, yeah, looking back on that period, it's it's just been momentous growth, really. And not least of all in football and in rugby. And we, we heard this past week that there's been a, a tremendous viewership for England rugby, the, the game against Rugby Canada that was on BBC Two this past weekend. A huge million people, a uh, million spectators that watched that uh, game. And then uh, for the um, North London derby, your team, Arsenal, played Spurs and there was no, almost a million watching that on BBC One, uh, which is awesome. But what I also like about that uh, um, it, that tweet that I found was that to the two lead cameras at the football and two thirds of the VT operators at the rugby were women, were women, and they you know they are, often are, but they're never mentioned. Yeah, I mean that's that's an incredible stat, and I think as well uh, it's important not to focus on you know obviously focus on the athletes and stuff, but then also looking at kind of what's going on behind the scenes and how many women there are, are involved in media and broadcasting and, um, you know, staff for teams, so like physios, medics and stuff like that. And, and also celebrating the women that are involved in, in the kind of behind the scenes of sport. So yeah, that, that is brilliant. That's, that's really good to hear. It's very, very encouraging. Nobody can say that, People don't want to watch rugby or football. And we're actually later on in the show going to hear from Ali Donnelly. You remember she was on with us uh, back last winter. Uh, She started Scrum Queens, which is a terrific website for women's rugby. And we're going to get her take on what's been happening in the sport very recently because there's been some major upsets um, that I wanted to unpack with us a little bit later on in the the show. But so first of all, we're going to actually cover the news and we're, we're going to go to Guadalajara in Mexico for the first story, aren't we? The WTA finals, which actually the final, the semifinals 
what hap- are happening today. We're recording this on Tuesday, November 16th, and the show will go out tomorrow on the 17th, which, uh, which is the day of the finals. So we're going to do a bit of prediction here and see who's your money on for the semifinals, Nancy? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting kind of lineup because I think, you know, for not like, you know, there there were quite a lot of the big names missing from these finals, I think. So you obviously didn't have Barty or Osaka. And then you've got players like Halep who kind of like slipped down the rankings a bit because of injury. Uh, obviously no Serena Williams or anyone like that. So it was kind of a time for some of the lesser known names maybe to shine. And I think we've had, especially three of the finalists, semi-finalists, I'd say, you know, have had a, just a massive year and only this year have they become, you know, quite established in tennis. And so I'd say uh, Paula Badoza, the Spanish player, uh, Maria Sicari, the Greek player, and then Annette Kontavit, uh, the Estonian player. So uh, they're joined by Garbine. Uh, I always struggle with her name, Muguruza, um, another Spaniard as well. Um, so the Badoza and Muguruza are playing and then Contavi and Sakari. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite hard to predict because, because of what I've said, you know, there, there's not really kind of any of the bigger names. Uh, they've all had relatively successful years. Um, I think Contavi is probably the one to watch because she's kind of just gone from zero to a hundred. Yeah. Um, you know, she, I don't, I think she, she was really struggling only about kind of three months ago. Um, and then has just completely turned it around, uh, kind of won, you know, every competition she was playing in, she was winning basically, and then qualified for the WTA finals at the very last minute uh, by winning. It was the Transylvanian Open, I think. Um, and yeah, has now made it to the semifinals and, and has got Maria Sakari, who is obviously also a very good player. Um, now and, she's the yeah. one whose biceps you envy. Yeah, she she's she, I've just never seen a tennis player. I know we we were talking about this earlier and and you said you have um but I think it was a few years ago but I I've never seen a tennis player that's so strong. I think she must be so intimidating to play against because you can literally like see the power almost in her arms. They're just <laughs> yeah, ridiculous biceps. Um and then yeah, in the, in that other semi-final, the all Spanish semi-final I think Muguruza is uh, obviously a lot more established. She's kind of been around for a while and has, um, she has won a Grand Slam, hasn't she? I think she's. Yes. Um, so. I think. Me on the spot here. We're, she, I'm pretty sure she's won Wimbledon and I think also the French Open. I'm nearly certain she's won a Grand Slams, plural. So she, she's been around for a lot longer and then Badoza's kind of quite up and coming uh she won indian wells um so that's kind of youth against experience mm-hmm. um so i you know what i'm gonna say i can't call it because it's just a, such a mix such a you know a real kind of just varied talent there and they've all got different strengths so i'm, I'm just i think yeah. it will just come down to literally who's stronger on the day yeah, I know. I don't think I can call it either. Um, well, <laughs> we will see. We'll talk about it next week for sure. Um, those finals happening on the 17th of November in Guadalajara. Uh, we're, we're the, well, we have another uh, tennis story and, and news from the WTA, don't we, before we move on? Yeah, so this is a slightly uh, kind of more shocking, you know, kind of more on the serious side than, than the previous story. But um, there's quite a serious concern over the Chinese tennis player Peng Sh- Sh- do you know how you say her surname is it Shuai? Shuai isn't it? Shuai mm-hmm. yeah Peng Shuai um, so she uh, at the start of the month um, made um, allegations of sexual assault against um, China's former vice premier um, so one of their former political leaders um, and then, so she made it on Weibo, which is the social media kind of network in China. Um, and then this post was kind of immediately deleted. And since she hasn't been heard from or, se- or you know, no one's seen her, um, the WTA have said that they've, from, from sources, they've been uh, assured that she's safe and well, but they say that they haven't been able to speak to her directly and that, the people she's got in con- they've got in contact with in terms of you know players that might know her or her friends they also say they haven't spoken to her directly 
Um, so the WTA have issued an appeal um, firstly calling for the investigation into the sexual assault allegations that Shuai made and then also saying that uh, she shouldn't be censored um, and that any woman that makes these allegations um, should be kind of treat they should be treated um, fairly and you know with respect and that their allegations should be taken seriously Um this is, you know, quite, I think quite a big deal for the WTA to, you know, I don't want to applaud them for something that they should be doing because ultimately they should be doing this. But they do have quite a significant investment in China. Um, the WTA finals are normally meant to take place in Shenzhen. And the only re- re- reason they're not this year is because of coronavirus. Um, so, yeah, they've, they've got very significant investment and quite a solid partnership with China. So I think to speak you know really kind of strongly against china and and what they've you know they've obviously silenced shui so to speak so strongly against that i think is is quite courageous of the organization and hopefully it will make a difference and um yeah should be found safe and and like they've said that this the allegation she's made will actually be properly investigated Yes, yes, good for them, as you say, doing the right thing, but uh, at least they're doing it. Um, more tennis news, though, um, from, did we mention Emma Ranocano once before on the programme? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is actually, this week is probably the, the most quiet it's been about Emma Ranocano. I think she's kind of, fight, you know, she's been playing, She she's uh, lost the tournament she was playing in, last week so her season has basically ended so it's gone a little bit quiet on her but before pre-season she did confirm her new coach so there was a bit of speculation about who it was going to be um, and she's hired Torben Belts um, a German coach who for the majority of his career has worked with uh, Angelique Kerber um, so he was kind of back and forth with her but during during his time with her he helped her win two Grand Slams um, so the Australian Open, the US Open. She also reached the Wimbledon final and uh, got an Olympic silver medal under him and became world number one as well. So they were obviously very successful together. And I think when Radhikanu was looking for a new coach, she said she wanted someone with uh, experience on the WTA tour because she's obviously very inexperienced. She's hardly played on the tour. Um, and it, seems, it sounds like she's definitely got that with belts. You know, he's... He's been around for years. He's helped his players win Grand Slams. And yeah, it's uh, kind of now she's got this whole period until the Australian Open in, in February to to be working with him and, and getting fit again. So it's it's quite an exciting partnership. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing seeing how, if you know, if they work together well and if so, what she can achieve under him. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever works for her, because she does need that experience to help her youth. You'd always hope that there would be a you know a woman coach that would be stepping up. That there were, were indeed more women coaches in it, in every sport. Um, but the, the best of luck to Emma. Whatever works for her. Um, we're going to move on to darts this week. We don't often have a dart story, but when we do, it often involves Fallon Sherrick, the British player. Yeah, we are kind of moving into dart season now. So depending on how Sherrick does, uh, you know, at the World Championships next month, she might be featuring a lot more. But um, yeah, I mean, she's she's such a trailblazer in darts. Um, yeah, she, she, she became, first kind of became famous. I think it was the 2019 World Championships when she became the first woman to win a match at the World Championships and then sub- subsequently won another one. Um, but she's now broken the record for the highest televised average by a female player. Um, so she was playing at the Grand Slam of Darts in Wolverhampton and uh, beat Mike Dedeker 5 0 and uh, scored an average of 101.55, which is the record. And uh, it's quite nice as well because the record had previously been set in March by Lisa Ashton. Uh, and that score was 100.3. So it's quite nice that the record was a relatively new one because I think it shows that women in darts are getting kind of stronger and more confident and constantly bettering each other and, you know, kind of setting this new standard. Um, so, yeah, like I said, she'll be competing at the um, World Championships next month. And I believe Lisa Ashton is as well. 
So I'm really excited to see if she can kind of, well, both of them can continue to be these these trailblazers and darts. Yeah, good for her. Um, love to get her on the show sometime. Um, maybe we, you could, you're on the right side of the pond there to set that up with Fallon. Yeah, um, see what I can do. Yeah, I think it would be really great to talk to her. All right, next story actually is uh, some hard news again. Going back, we're flipping back and forth between hard and soft news this week, um, and this involves the Olympic gold medal gymnast Sunny Lee. And this was a story that broke in our local Washington paper. Uh, that uh, I think it picked up with the global sports news eventually. Did, did you see it over there? Yeah, we. D- I did see it. Yeah, it's a very kind of frustrating news story. Um, yeah, so it's uh, Sunny Lee, like you said, the Olympic gold medalist uh, in gymnastics. Um, so she won the all around. Um, yeah, a, a quite quite famously, obviously Simone Biles wasn't competing, and she kind of came in and and won the gold medal and yeah, was gave a really impressive performance. Yeah. Uh, but she's told how she recently experienced a racist attack uh, while waiting with her friends who are also of Asian descent. Um, and she said that a group sped by them in a car and yelled racist slurs and that she also got um, sp- sprayed on her arm with pepper spray. And yeah, she's just kind of talked about how difficult she found it. So she was like, she said she was so mad, but there wasn't anything she could do or control because they just left in the car. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a very frustrating story and it, you know, just should, shouldn't really be happening at all. And, yeah. yeah, I suppose at least she's kind of got the profile to be sharing about it and making people aware that this kind of thing does happen. But ultimately it's, uh, yeah, shouldn't shouldn't be happening. No, appalling. All right, we've got some good news from Canada, though. Another woman pointed to an executive position. Yeah, so this is uh, from the Canadian Olympic Committee. Uh, They've uh, appointed... Sorry, I've literally just lost the story. Um, can we pause? Just one they second. have put, well, we can keep going. Um, we've, um, but they've, the, the Canadian Olympic Committee, this is, they've just announced that Jacqueline Ryan has been named as their foundation's chief executive officer and she'll have responsibilities uh, with the brand and uh, uh, retaining. She had previously had responsibilities with the brand um, as the chief brand and commercial officer, overseeing the brand and commercial affairs, digital and marketing partnership. Um, of the COC. So she's broadened her responsibilities there. But, uh, you know, I wanted to keep mentioning when these women get, you know, promoted or get new positions in sports governance, um, no matter what their role is, because we need more of that, don't we? We do need more women in the boardroom. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, there's still, it's still, we're still so kind of far behind with the number that we need to be because ultimately we want to be 50 50 really um in kind of positions of power in sport and yeah we're not quite there so i think yeah like you said anytime women are appointed we definitely have to shout about it yeah for sure um, and just a reminder that we do also include a lot more stories than the ones that we cover here on the show. And that's uh, thanks to our friends at the Women's Sports Business Newsletter, which comes into our inboxes every week. And we add all of those stories, which are again from around the world. They do focus on the business of women's sports. And they are there, they come from Elisa LaHoy, who's been on our show here before, back over the winter. And she gathers all these sports stories, uh, which we add uh, with the links to the to the extended story but you can find them on the show page of this of this show uh, that's at wisports.com so lots more news from around the world of women's sports uh, than you actually hear on the podcast uh, well we're going to move on to to football now because of course it's the coming to this playoff season here we're coming to this to the finals of the nwsl which will take place in louisville kentucky uh the home of the kentucky derby and a lot more things that are Actually, it's a very sporting city, Louisville, and they're hosting uh, after a bit of a kerfuffle. It was originally going to be in Portland, and unfortunately, the, the players kicked up a bit of a fuss and said, we don't want to be at oh, Dark 30 in Portland, and they moved it to Louisville, uh, which is on uh, Eastern time. It's not central, it's Eastern time, and uh, that's going to be, I think, at 9 a.m. Pacific, so that's 12 noon 
uh, Eastern on Saturday, the 20th of November. So this coming Saturday, we're going to see the finals, which will be between Washington Spirit and Chicago Red Stars. What a, an interesting semifinals that was last week on the left coast, Nancy. Yeah, I didn't, you know, kind of, unfortunately for me, it's quite an uh, un, unsociable time. It's kind of in the middle of the night for us, so I don't really get to see it. But I think judge, just from what I know um, about the NWSL, which granted is not kind of, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert, but I was quite surprised by the scores. Um the teams that made it to the final because yeah, I think you look at Portland Fawns and Rain and I think, you know, mm-hmm. they come across as the two strongest teams. So yeah, really interesting to have the yeah, Chicago Red Stars and Washington Spirit in the final. I'm interested to see how that one plays out. Yeah, it real it really will be. Of course, I'm cheering on my local team, Washington Spirit. Um, but yeah, credit credit to them and you know, it was a great the first semi-final, um, which started at two thirty our time, no, uh, no, sorry, three three p.m. on Sunday last weekend, our time, and that was between Oil Rain and Washington Spirit, and, and the Spirit came away two one, thanks to Eugenie Le Summer, the French player. She gave Rain the early lead with a goal in the vase th- in the third minute, which Judge Parent is the f- is the f- f- earliest goal. Um, in playoff history in the third minute, but it was a lovely gift from uh, somebody called Rapino on the left wing. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never heard of her. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no, she's she, she a bit of a red, like pink, pink head, and she had a smiley face on the back of her head. Yeah, but, I was going to say, I think that that was definitely the thing I saw most from it was uh, Rapino's uh, smiley face on the back of her head, and unfortunately, I mean. At, probably by the end of the match she probably wished it was an unhappy face but uh yeah no I, I thought that it was an interesting look <laughs> yes it's a new it's a new look it's a real short crop that megan's got going there well that uh, did give them the you know the advantage very 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 early on but the spirit came back very quickly actually in the 12th minute uh thanks to trinity rodman now she's a player that everybody's talking about over here she declined to uh uh, go to Australia with the uh, with the team, the, the uh, national squad, <clears throat> um, which leaves pretty shortly, I think, for two friendlies in Australia. But she's a player that the NWSL is very excited about. You probably heard her name uh, as much as you would have had uh, Ashley San- Sanchez, who scored the winner in the 68th minute. Yeah, I mean, Rodman is uh, definitely, definitely hearing a lot about her over here. Um, seen some clips of her goals and um, yeah, looks like a very exciting player. Yeah, yeah, very, very excited. There's a lot of wonderful young players I'm really looking forward to seeing more of this season. I think there's six rookies that are going to be on the on the team for those friendlies in Australia. So very, very exciting to, to see them come out and be given a chance while the veterans um, have, a, have a rest over the holiday season. But we, we have to mention that, of course, the Chicago Red Stars, they beat Portland 2-0 as well. So that was a great game for them. It really was. And that surprised me. I, I you know, when you think of who's on that Portland Thorns team, Nancy, not least of all, Christine Sinclair, who hasn't had much luck in recent games. You know, she's usually such a high scorer, but not so much lately. Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose maybe the playing at the Olympics, having a long run in the Olympics, you know, going all the way to the final, yeah. maybe that's had a bit of an effect on her as well. Kind of the obviously a very not much chance for rest this year, uh, so maybe that's had a bit of an effect on her. It may be, it may well have. Um, we'll see how she comes back because she's again one of those veterans of the game, and all eyes will be on Canada next year. That's for sure. Uh, for some other items of news: we've got some breaking news today uh, involving Laura Harvey and Sam Kerr, and then there's a, that piece about um, Bella Bixby. So, where do you want to start? Um, yeah, I suppose if we go with Bella Bixby first, seeing as she played. Portland Fawns in that playoff um, but yes yeah, so straight off or pretty soon after the game she actually revealed that her um, father had died by suicide in the in the week before the match um, so she uh, yeah only kind of said on social media afterwards um, and that yeah she said that she was surprised by how strong she'd been uh, but she couldn't hold it in anymore and that the fact that she played for Portland Fawns would have meant so much to him 
Um, so yeah, I mean, just absolutely incredible that she did play and thoughts with her and hope, hope she kind of, you know, can pro- probably she had that match on her mind as well. And it was probably quite hard to grieve properly, but hopefully now she can have kind of like a proper grieving process. And yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, maybe some some downtime a little bit, but she is on that squad to go to Australia. This is going to be her debut um, uh, as a as a goalie, uh, so that will be something for her to look forward to. I hope, and of course, it's the holiday holiday season. It's Thanksgiving next week, so uh, I'm sure a little bit of downtime now for for her. But uh, yeah, absolutely, condolences to her. That's uh, that takes a really strong woman. To, to handle that kind of news and go into a major competition for your for your team. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think um, there's quite something quite similar here where we had Rachel Daly uh, play, play for England oh, yes. like a couple of days after yeah. her dad died as well. And it's, yeah, yeah. just remarkable strength, really. Yeah, yeah. How will our thoughts are with them? Now, uh, more news from the left coast uh, with, well, one of ours, a British coach, Laura Harvey. She's been over here so long, we consider her American as well. Yes, yeah, so she's uh, been named NWSL Coach of the Year for 2021. I think probably hasn't ended quite the way she wanted it to be with uh, Rain being knocked out in the semi-finals. So I imagine she probably wanted to obviously go on and win uh, the final. Um, but I mean, for her kind of personally, it's it's had the third time she's she's won the accolade. So that's the most of any NWSL coach, um, which just shows, yeah, she's she is a brilliant, like you said, she's, you know, been in the US, she's been over here with Arsenal as well. And um, yeah, I'd love to see her come back to England, to be honest, and, and coach a team over here. But yeah, congratulations to her. Yeah, very, very good news. Well well done, Laura. We had her on the show some time ago with Katie Stengel when Utah Royals was in existence. Of course, she coached Utah Royals. Uh, so that's when we last heard from Laura on the show. But very good news for her. Well done. Um, some exciting news for Chelsea, too. Yeah, yeah. Sam Kerr, the Australian striker who is one of the most prolific strikers in the world, Um she previously held the record for the most goals scored in uh, the Australian League. Uh, she has the record for the all-time leading scorer in the American League, and she's not quite getting there for. Well, she's not. She's not quite there yet for the WSL, but she finished last season as top scorer. Um, and yeah, just a really. It's obviously Chelsea. If, uh, as an Arsenal supporter, it's not great to see such amazing players at your at a rival team. But just for the league, it's great to have players like Sam Kerr over here. Um, and yeah, she she signed a new two year deal with Chelsea, so uh, we'll be staying until at least twenty twenty four. So yeah. she joined in twenty nineteen. So that's essentially already. You know, she's kind of five years at the club um, she's committed to already. So, and you know, they, they, they're such a strong club as well that she'd definitely be winning more trophies with them. Um, so yeah, as an Arsenal fan, it's uh, a bit annoying, but uh, you know, as a women's <laughs> football fan, it's, it's amazing to have her over here. Yeah, no, for good, for good. She, and if she, she is trouble when she's on the, on the pitch, you know, when Sam's playing. Um, but uh, Sam and K- uh, Kirsty Mew, uh, Mew is her girlfriend. Are they going to be at least happy that Kirsty is on the squad that's going to Australia when they play those friendlies? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that Sam will be on those. I know they're only friendlies and we're playing a lot of new blood, uh, but I'm assuming she will be going back home for those friendlies. Uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think she, I think she is in the squad. Um, yeah, I think there were a few jokes that they'd somehow arranged that friendly. <laughs> they That's why it's called a friendly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great news. All right. Well, um, before we let you go, because I know you're going to move on before we bring in Ali this week, but uh, there's some World Rugby Awards nominees news too, which takes us ni- next li- nicely into our next segment. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, like you said, World Rugby have listed the nominees for their uh, just their annual awards. Um, it's for the women's women's side of things. It's uh, it shows how great this year has been for England because um, for the 15s at least, uh, there's there's two English players, so Zoe Aldcroft and Poppy Cleal, and then two French players, Caroline Bouchard and Law Sanzus. Um, so that's for the World Rugby Women's 15s Player of the Year award. 
Um, then also the uh, women's sevens. Um, so there's Anne Cecil Stefani from France, Sarah Harini from New Zealand, and then two Fijian players um, who um, they won silver at the or bronze. I think bronze at the Olympics. Yeah, because New Zealand won gold and France won won silver. Uh, so the Alawesi Nakochi and Ripi Ulun oh, Ulunisal. Uh, sorry, I've probably ruined their surnames. Um, so, yeah, they're the sevens player of the year. Um, and then there's a number of other awards, including try of the year um, and coach of the year, which includes both for men and women's. So it's really great to see the England women's coach, Simon Middleton, um, included on that. And then also the New Zealand women's sevens coaches, Alan Bunting and Corey Sweeney as well. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, going to be... Vote, you can vote on that if you wish to vote. Um, that's open until Sunday, the 21st of November. And then I think they'll be announcing the winners next month. So, yeah, it's a, a good variation. And from an English perspective, it's great to see some English talent on that. It just shows yes. that, you know, we're getting stronger as a rugby, a women's rugby nation. Yeah. And they have a lot to celebrate right now, having beaten the, the Black Ferns twice and which is so unusual, and then France beat them. So we're going to talk about all of that and more with Annie Do- Ali Donnelly from Scrum Queens in, in just a second. But before you go, Nancy, um, I, you know my memory is just getting worse by the day. I don't know if it's the COVID effect or what it is, but I just keep forgetting names. And, you know, I've, you, we were talking about Sakari's biceps, or you were. You have a thing about <laughs> Sakari's biceps. It was Amelie Moresmo, the French okay, player. Yeah. Yeah, of course she's tall. I don't know if she's even taller than Sakari. I think she probably is. I don't think Sakari is necessarily tall, is she? I'll have to look that up. I don't as well. think. No, I don't think she's taller than average or anything like that. Right, but um, Emily was tall and very strong. Yeah, and she was. I know. I remember her or know her because she was a coach for Andy Murray. She's she bucking was. that trend of. Uh, you know, you hardly ever see a male player have a female coach and she bucks that trend. Yes. So, yes. yeah, she's yes. she's cool. Yes, thank you. thank you, Andy. I don't know who she's coaching now, but yeah, no, I've got an opportunity either. for Emma. Uh, maybe yeah. she didn't have her number or something. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, a lot more news to come. Um, as I said, as always, here on With Sports, we uh, try and gather as much of news as we can from around the world of women's sports. Um, and we have yet more to come, but Nancy's going to slip away and do exciting things with the rest of her evening as we segue into our rugby se- se- segment before we wrap up here this week. So thanks, Nancy. I'll see you next week. Yeah, see you next week. And as I promised, we're back now for our rugby segment. We're going to be joined by Ali Donnelly, who's been with us before. Ali is from scrumqueens.com. I love that website, Ali. You do a fantastic job, and it's lovely to have you back. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. There's a lot of uh, women's rugby news around at the moment. By golly, there is. And what an upset with the Black Ferns getting defeated, not once, not twice, but three in a row. How unusual is that? Yeah, I mean, all sorts of records being broken on their European tour. So the, the losses so far have all been record losses for them. Uh, twice to England, now once to France. And you'd have to say probably going to lose again to France this weekend unless there's you know major turnaround. Um, I think losing to England probably wasn't as big an upset as it might once have been uh, for a whole load of reasons. England, you know, really, really pressing the accelerator on professionalism, on the kind of next steps to their league and so on. But the, I think the manner of the defeats and the kind of you know the, the score lines have been quite shocking. Um, and then in France again, they just looked absolutely lost at times. So very worrying time if you're a New Zealand fan. It certainly is because traditionally they've they've been you know the the, the doyen of of the sport, haven't they? For for a very long as long as my memory goes back in women's rugby. Yeah, they have. I mean, they have, you know often not played between World Cups and just turned up and won it anyway. Um, They've been the team to beat for everyone. They've been world number ones for a very long time. Um, But England have been knocking on the door on and off, you know, over the last decade. Obviously, they won the World Cup in 2014. New Zealand got knocked out by Ireland. Um, And then, you know, New Zealand came back in 2017 and won. So, yeah, I think for me, what's, what's really difficult for New Zealand now is 
obviously they have to go and look at their program again and think about what they're going to do over the next year because they host the World Cup in less than a year. But the aura of the Black Ferns is gone, I think. I don't think England or France are going to be afraid to play them. I think Canada would currently relish playing them. And <laughs> that's a sign that, that is a significant problem for them because very often, you know, they'd beaten teams before they'd even played them because people were, you know, held them in such esteem. So that's yeah. um that's really interesting kind of secondary aspect to these losses. That's very true, isn't it? You know, it's the dynamics of these international teams, you know, and the reputation they, and the intimidation that they put on just simply by being who they are. And, and that's how the teams regarded the Black Ferns. That's very, very true. But, you know, Canada are not to be messed with either. But just to go back to the Black Ferns, this wasn't just in the 15s, also in the 7s too. Well, the sevens team, obviously coming off the back of Olympic glory. So I think one of the challenges New Zealand have is to work out how they can have two successful programs. They've got one now mm -hmm. um, in the sevens program, fully funded. A lot of that money is coming, of course, not from the union, but from the Olympic Federation um, and from Sport New Zealand and so on. So, you know, they, they sort of cracked one knot currently and then another has fallen, you know, kind of badly away. So, yeah, I, I I wonder if those running the game there are a little perplexed though, because they have historically underinvested in their 15s program, but they won and they they just used to go and win anyway, win anyway. so it yeah. didn't really matter. Yeah. And now they are actually investing, maybe modestly, some would say, but they've contracted players on a semi pro basis. They've introduced a Super Rugby competition. Um, you know, they're really working on their strength and conditioning programs. So, you know, they might be sitting back in New Zealand wondering, wow, we're putting more investment in than ever and the results are getting worse. And I think the simple answer to that is England and France have been investing for much longer and New Zealand are just playing catch up. And, you know, whether they can catch up in time to win next year's World Cup, I don't know. Yeah, it's very, very interesting change of dynamics, how the rest of the world is is up the game, literally, um, and, and New Zealand now are having to play catch-up themselves. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, we, we keep hearing news, and over the last, what, during COVID, really, last couple of years, we've heard about the professional contracts for for England. and They've just gone from strength to strength, haven't they? They are very professional now. Yeah, and I think for England, it's not just about the professional contracts, although those are important and they've now been pro athletes for three years and all of that's making a difference to how they recover. You know, they look incredibly fit and physical and, you know, the fact that they can all train every day obviously helps. But there's more to England's success, I think. I think the league, the Premier 15s here, has been a phenomenal success. It's not been without its, you know, um, teething problems for sure. But, you know, you're, we're seeing players come in to play in that from around the world uh, because the standard is excellent and because they get a lot of game time. And if you look at New Zealand, the players are not getting anywhere near as much game time as, as English players are. And so I think the contracts are important for England, but they're just one piece of the jigsaw. And so the other pieces are, you think, are you know, the whole package of being a professional athlete now that they can train every day and they're getting the competitions that they need. And they, they, they're united as a team that are seeing each other regularly. That makes a big difference, doesn't it, to the morale and the psychology of the team? Oh, definitely. They're, they're turning up fresh to training, you know, which when you're juggling a full-time job or a part-time job and you're training, that, that's not the case. I, I interviewed Abby Dow, one of the England winners, who's been phenomenal over the last two years. And, and she talked about very small, simple things like having time to really look at your nutrition. And, you know, she, she gave a really kind of basic example of you come home exhausted from training and you don't have to just bung a sauce on. You, you actually can take the time to yes. cook something from scratch because you've got time. Yes. And it was just a silly example, but it was a very good one because all of that adds up, right, over yes. years and years. Um, so, yeah, they're at a considerable advantage. I mean, I suppose the negative for the women's game is the playing field is so uneven now. We've got, you know, fully pro England, semi-pro France, sort of semi-pro light New Zealand because it's slightly less, it's not as quite as good a deal as the French players. And now we've got some a handful of contracts coming into Wales. There's some in Scotland. So the game is is uneven. And, you know, we're going to have the USA playing. Canada played England the weekend, USA this weekend, all amateur players. Uh, and that's hard. How are you going to beat a fully pro team when yeah, you're just taking sure. three weeks off work to travel here? So yeah. those things are, aren't necessarily the best thing for the game. Um, so, you know, obviously we need the world calendar to kick off, which is happening after the next World Cup. And, you know, more teams playing more games ultimately. But right now, I, I think England are going to be 
an extremely hard team to beat for the foreseeable future. And we should give a shout out to our friend Polly uh, Poppy Cleo because she's uh, just been nominated. We, just before you came on, Ali, we touched on the um, Women Rugby Awards, no, World Rugby Award nominees, um, and of course she's in, in in that list, which is fantastic. But there's quite a selection there from different nations, isn't there? Yeah, well, I think she's probably got to win it for me. I mean, she's had, really? an, uh, yeah, she's had an incredible year. Um, I think she was part of the Six Nations. Uh, she fronts up for her club. She's just a talismanic player for England now. She's captain England as well this this autumn. Um, and yeah, so she, but yes, Laura Sansu's the French scrum half, who I'm a huge fan of, is in there. Zoe Allcroft played extremely, extremely well as well. So yeah, th- there's a good mix of players in there, but I, I don't think you can look beyond Poppy. That said, I don't know why they've done this. Well, I do know why they've done this, but World Rugby have turned this into a fans vote which I hate because it's a prestigious award and you should have prestigious people who understand, see the game, pick it. So I hope she wins, but no guarantee with the public vote. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Now, what else is happening that we need to know about, Ali? Yeah, there's been a big challenge in Ireland over the last couple of weeks, which is my my home country. Um, The players... You know, the players have had a very tough year um, from a playing perspective and they failed to qualify for the World Cup. They went to the qualifiers initially. They, they I think they, I would have made them favourites to win it. Not only did they not come in the top two, but, you know, they didn't qualify. And there's been a sort of unedifying kind of public row between um, the man who's in charge of the programmes there and the players. They, they felt that in his interviews last week, he pointed the fingers at them and blamed them for the loss and didn't take any responsibility. So we've seen some pretty... Um, you know, disappointing narrative around Ireland and clearly there's not a happy camp there in terms of the dynamic between those leading it and those playing. And then today, some really sad news that Kira Griffin, the Irish captain's retiring. She's only 27, which feels incredibly, it just feels way too young uh, to be retiring from international rugby. You know, she got best part of a decade left in her. She's a back row player. So uh, the Irish camp is not a happy one currently. Um, there's an ongoing review looking at some of the failures there from you know recent years. So we have to sort of wait and see where we get to. But unfortunately, for those of us who've been covering the Irish game for a long time, this happens every few years. Big story blows up. The IRFU just kind of stick their fingers in their ears, frankly. And, you know, nothing really happens. So the Irish game is not in a good place. And when you consider that they were winning Six Nations just a few years ago, they were fourth in the world. Um, it's pretty disappointing. That is disappointing. Well, why did she choose now to retire then so young? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, her statement today says just, you know, she um, just felt it was the right time. I mean, she has had to shoulder a lot of burden, I think, off the field as well as on the field with all of the fallout from 2017 where they crashed out of their own home World Cup, finished eighth, I think, in the end. You know, they were, they were, everybody would have picked them as semi finalists at one point. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's probably been a very hard toll on her. But look, I don't know her very well at all. Um, so I, I couldn't speak for her. But I, I think it's, it's very unusual that, you know, you're the captain of your country and you're retired 27 years old, frankly. So, you know, I hope maybe she comes back to the fold one day, but um, quite, quite, quite a big rebuild job there for Ireland now. Yeah, for sure. And, w- and what games are we looking forward to now? You said that Black Ferns have got their second game against France, which you yeah, expect the like, same yeah. kind of result. That's this weekend. Yeah. It's hard to see beyond, um, it's very hard to see beyond France winning. I mean, they were so comfortable in their victory at the weekend that um, anything other than a win would be a shock now, which is, you know, the idea of New Zealand going home with four losses is, you know, was unthinkable, but that's where we're headed. Yeah. Um, England, USA, I presume England will make a lot of changes, maybe bring some new faces in. The USA have had a hard few weeks. You know, they played Canada twice in a week, played Ireland last weekend. Yeah. Um, they've got some good players individually, USA, but they, you know, just made so many errors in Dublin under no pressure at all. So I think they will struggle to keep, you know, England will, be, England will probably put 50 on them, which is just you know, an example of the way things are currently. Um, and then Ireland against Japan would be interesting. You know, the Japanese haven't had a great tour in terms of results, but, you know, they're going over to Ireland with nothing to lose. So that'll be an interesting game. And then in a couple of weeks' time, I'm really looking forward to seeing South Africa play the Barbarians. So Barbarians women's team, South Africa at Twickenham, which would be great. Ah, oh, um, I'm envious because yeah. you're just right down the road. Ha. Yeah, so that's not far away at all. So that'll be a good one to end the autumn on, I think. The Barbarians such a fun team. Yes. And they haven't named all their players yet, but the ones they have named are excellent. 
and South Africa, from what I've seen so far, they're a little bit naive, I think. They're just inexperienced, but they really do have a go. So that should be quite a fun game and a massive pitch at Twickenham. We have to give a shout out to our own Alona Meyer, who was called up to the 15s from the seven squads over here in, in the US to play Canada. They lost, as you pointed out, they lost a couple of times to them, unfortunately. Um, and then they headed to Ireland. Now they're going to head to England, uh, which which will be uh, a tough session for them. A uh, few games on the trot, but uh, good for Alona. She got some 15s practice again and she heads back to the sevens. Well, she's already back because they're getting ready. The sevens are getting ready to go to Dubai. So yeah, yeah. it was a shame. It's a little bit of a shame, actually, for USA to lose um, Ailef Kilter and and Alona because obviously they're two fantastic players, and it's, you know, but they're contracted sevens players. But she's also become such a great personality in the women's sevens program. So that's yes. been really fun to watch. <laughs> she certainly has. Yeah. Um, well, that's terrific, Lally. I appreciate you coming on for a roundup. We, we're going to do this formally and regularly because we do like your input when it comes to rugby. Scrumqueens.com is where you'll find Ali's reports. There's constant news on there. And there's what three of you feeding that website to bring us up to date with world rugby from 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 everywhere for women's rugby yeah well look we're just very passionate volunteers and we you know we feel kind of committed to bringing the game news but also in championing you know many of the many challenges and you know profiling the players and so on. i mean i think ultimately we'd like one day to not need to exist because mainstream media will be covering this you know in a more sustainable way but look we have fun doing it and, and we enjoy doing it fantastic well we uh, very much welcome you as as a partner here and and look forward to uh regular contributions from you ali keep us uh, apprised of what's going on in the world of women's rugby thanks so much and i look forward to coming back yeah see you in a couple of weeks ali thank you so much i really appreciate your time take care see ya and that's our show for this week. Don't forget you can find the show notes and the links to all the stories that we cover here on the WIS Sports Desk at the website. Just use the drop-down menu under Listen and you'll find the WIS Sports Desk and all the episodes for that show and for many others here at WIS Sports. And if you're already listening on the website, don't forget you can also listen on any podcast app. Just look for WIS Sports or WIS Sports Desk. And whilst you're on the app, we would love it if you have time to leave us a review or a rating because that helps others find the show. And as always, you can follow us on social media at Wisp Sports and you can follow Nancy at Nancy underscore Gillen. And one final thing before I leave you this week, for those basketball fans, we've got a real treat for you on Friday of this week when I'll be talking to Team GB Olympian, Temi Fangbenol, and she has an amazing story both on and off the court. She really is inspiring, and that's going to be on our Athlete Profile show. It will also be on the WIS Sports channel, wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll be back right here with Nancy next week, same time, same place. So until then, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.